Hi boys and girls. Um, it is a gorgeous day today outside. This is Saturday that I'm making this video and I just had to come outside because it's so pretty outside. Earlier the birds were singing. Um, one bird especially was singing all the time and uh, I think he was saying God is awesome. God is great. God is good. God is wonderful. If you hear the noise of gurgling water in the background, that's our fountain. Um, so we don't have a leak or anything, okay? We are going to do uh, a review today, a couple of review games um, before I do the story with you and sing a couple songs. Uh, I already re recorded those, so those will um, be on this also, but they'll be mixed up. So, I wanted to, before we start the review games, I wanted to tell you, be thankful. Be thankful for today, for the beauty, for the sunshine, for the flowers that are out, that you can be outside playing. And even more importantly than that, if you have brothers and sisters maybe not more importantly, but also as important. Be thankful for your brothers and sisters because during this time when you can't go and be with your friends, you have friends to play with and those are your brothers and sisters. Um, children who don't have brothers and sisters are alone and they can't get together with their friends. Um, so that is something you need to be thankful for. Uh, during this time, we hear a lot of criticizing, complaining, grumbling, negative things. But God can work in all situations. And in uh, the book of First Thessalonians, it says to pray continually and always with thanksgiving. So when you're saying your prayers, when you're outside enjoying the beautiful weather, give God a thank you. He would love it. Okay? All right. The first folder that we're going to do today, you did back in the fall. And it is the story of Joseph. Okay? And I'm going to hold this up. And my helper is going to help us with helping you to answer the questions today. Okay, we're going to start with number one. Okay. It's hard for me to read backwards. Who was Joseph's father? Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of choices. Okay. Was it Jacob? Or was it, I'm going to say, Reuben? Which one was... Um, Joseph's father. Okay. Jacob. Right. Jacob is the correct answer. Okay. Jacob was Joseph's father. Okay. Number two. How did Jacob feel towards Joseph? How did he feel? Did, did he not really care for Joseph? Um, did he call him Canaan? Or was he his favorite son? Which one is the correct answer? How did he feel about his son, Joseph? Right. He was his favorite son. He gave him the beautiful coat, right? That's why we have this, uh, these coats that we're putting on Joseph for our answers. Whoops. That one didn't stick too well. There we go. Okay. Number three, where did Jacob's family live? Where did they live? Did they live in Canaan? Egypt? Where did they live? What's the correct answer? Which one is the correct answer? Yes, they lived in Canaan. Later on, we know that they, whoops, that they moved to Egypt. But that's later on in the story, sorry. 
Okay, number four. How did, how old was Joseph when he got his special coat? When, when Jacob gave him the coat, how old was he? Was he 17 years old? Or was he ruling over his brothers? That doesn't really make sense, does it? So it has to be 17 years old. He was 17 years old. Okay, number five. What did Joseph's dreams mean? What did his dreams mean? Did they mean, I'll give you a choice and then we'll just put the right answer up. Did they mean that um, he was the best brother in the world or that he would rule over his brothers? Right, that he would rule over his brothers. That's the correct answer. Okay, now we'll go down to the second part. Number six. Which brother wanted to throw Joseph in the pit? Was it Reuben or Judah? Which one is the correct answer? Or was it, was it Potiphar? Was it Reuben or Potiphar? Oh, he already put it on there. It was Reuben, right? And what was he going to do later on? Do you remember? He was going to go back and get him out. How did Joseph's brothers deceive Jacob about Joseph? Okay. How did they deceive Jacob? Did they um, tell him that he ran away? Um, did they tell him that he decided he didn't want to live at home anymore? Or did they dip his coat in blood and let his father think that a wild animal killed him? Yes, that's what they did. And, and you might say, well, they didn't lie to him. He just, he just said that himself. But not telling the whole truth is lying. When you're deceiving somebody and they think something and you don't correct them, that's still lying. Number eight, Joseph was bought by who in Egypt? Who bought him, Pharaoh or Potiphar? Which one? Potiphar, correct. Potiphar is the one who bought him. Pharaoh was the ruler, right? And then the last one, why was Joseph successful in all he did? Why was he successful? Because God was with him. The Lord was with him. Those are kind of hard for you to read um, there. If I keep it back farther, that was better. Okay, so that's our review of Joseph. I wonder how many of you right now can name all of Joseph's brothers. Let's see if you can do it with me. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin. And then of course there's Joseph, okay? There's the 12 sons of Jacob. All right, in the winter quarter, we studied this story. I think you can tell what it is just by looking at the front of this folder. This is the story of the fiery furnace. So we're gonna do some little questions about the fiery furnace, okay? Okay, this time just let me give them a choice and you just give me the one, okay? The story of the fiery furnace takes place in what book of the Bible? Is it in the book of Exodus, Isaiah, or Daniel? Which one is the correct answer? Which book of the Bible does the story of the fiery furnace take place in?
There we go. Had trouble with it holding on. Daniel is the correct answer. Okay, number two. Who built the golden statue or the golden image for the people to worship and bow down to? Okay, somehow this one got lost. So I'm going to give you a choice and you just decide the right answer. We don't have an answer to put on there. But was it King Belshazzar? Or was it King Nebuchadnezzar? Or was it King Darius? Ah, oh, we studied all three of those. Which one built the golden image? Nebuchadnezzar, right? Yeah, that was the first one. Okay, who would not bow down and worship the golden image? Who chose not to worship the golden image? Was it all the captives from Jerusalem and Canaan? Was it Daniel? Or was it Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Right, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm sure that Daniel did not bow down to this image either because we know that he was faithful and he prayed to God only. Um, he might have been on some uh, mission for the king because remember the king uh, advanced him in his duties. So he might have been gone. So that's why he wasn't thrown in the fiery furnace. Okay. What happened to the to them because they would not worship the golden image? Sorry, I couldn't read that. What happened to them? Um, they got thrown in to an arena with lions. They got thrown in a fiery furnace or they got thrown over a cliff? Which one is the correct answer? Mm -hmm. Thrown in the fiery furnace, right. Cast. Okay. Um, how hot did the king command the furnace to be made? Did he say, I want this furnace to be made three times hotter, seven times hotter, or 90 times hotter? Which one is correct? Seven times hotter. Yes. Okay, now we're going to skip the next one and come back to it. We're going to go down to number seven. How many men did King Nebuchadnezzar see when he looked into the furnace? How many men did he see? Did he see four, three, or ten? How many did he see? Four men, right. He said, wait a minute, didn't I just throw three men in there? Who's that I see? And and he said, what was the form of the fourth man like? The king said he looks like the, um, he looks like my son. He looks like the son of God. He looks like the son of Daniel. Who did he say that the image looked like? The Son of God, right. And describe the three men who came out of the fiery furnace. Okay, when they came out, did they open up the furnace and the men just walked out and they didn't smell like smoke, their hair wasn't burnt, their clothes weren't burnt, there was no... Um, singeing, no yucky smoke smell, or did they have to pull them out because they were so burnt up? What's the correct answer there? Mm -hmm. Right. They didn't even smell like smoke, nothing. I'm getting a glare on here for some reason. Oh, it's off the table. That's what it is. I'm sorry. There, now you can see better. 
the glass in the table was um, causing it to glare. Okay, and here's the last one that we skipped. Whoops, that one decided to do a little jig there. Okay, what happened to the men who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace? What happened to them? The fire slew them. What does slew mean? It means it killed them, right? So they did not live, the men who threw them in the fiery furnace because it was so hot. Okay, that was good. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope that uh, you will enjoy the story coming up and get out and enjoy these great days where you can be outside and play. Be obedient to your moms and dads and be thankful. And remember, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Bye. Good evening, boys and girls. Uh, you'll be watching this probably um, some morning, maybe, or maybe in the afternoon, or maybe in the evening. But um, it's, the, it's Wednesday evening. It's Wednesday night, in fact. And normally we would be together uh, for an hour on Wednesdays. But um, that won't be happening for a while. So... Uh, as long as um, these stories are needed, I will be trying to read you some great Bible stories and doing some games and um, singing some songs on uh, video here. Today, to start with, I want to sing the two songs that we learned from the first two videos. Um, I hope that you will remember them and believe the words of them and let them be alive in your heart and in the way you act each day with your family, with your neighbors, with your friends. I know you can't see your friends right now, but um, when you are able to be together with them again. You gave up your throne for a manger, traded a crown for a cross, laid down your life for a stranger, for all who are broken and lost. You came down from the heavens so we would know how deep how high, how long, and how wide, and how far love goes. How deep, how high, how long, and how wide, and how far love goes. Jesus loved you so much that he gave up his throne, his wonderful, perfect home in heaven, to come down to earth because he loved you so much. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. In sign language, this means Jesus. And this is yes. So that's why we do those motions with it. Would you like to do them again? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And then we learned this song from Cradle Roll Days. 
I'm a special person. There's no one like me. I'm glad I am. That's my name. That's me. God thinks I am special. He thinks you're special too. I am glad because I am me and you are you. Don't ever forget that. You're special, not because of what you do, not because of how you look, not because of whose family you're in. You're special because God made you and God loves you. Okay, to, tonight I want to share another song with you that goes with the book that we're going to read called This Is The Day. And it goes like this. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. That comes from a verse in Psalms. And um, I hope that the message of that um, rejoicing in the day, in Philippians 4.4 4, it says rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Um, even though there are things going on right now that you don't like, that you can't go to school and be with your friends, that you have to not be able to go to playgrounds and, and parks and be able to play like that, that you um, can't even really maybe go to the grocery store or to another store or, or to your favorite restaurant um, with your mom and dad, but find something, find something in each day to be thankful for because we're told in Philippians chapter 4 not to be anxious or worried about anything but to always be thankful because when we're praying to our Father God we can ask him to be with people that are having struggles from this virus we can ask him to heal people we can ask him to make it end soon but we're always supposed to ask with thanksgiving, it says in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. And you know what? Then we're promised God's peace, the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we as Christians should be showing that peace, not, oh no, oh no, what's going to happen? Oh, I'm so worried, I'm so scared. No, no, no. We know that God is in control and we know that God is going to win in the end. And so we can be confident and we can have joy even in the midst of hard times and in sad times because we know that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves us so much. Okay, here is the book. This is the day. And I'm going to have to turn this a little bit so you can see all the pictures. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Psalm 118, 24. Monday. This is the day the Lord has made. Tiptoe out into the morning world and stretch like the deer reaching for an apple high on the golden tree. Skip through the dew, diamonds glistening on the lawn where the quail feed. I'm trying to take that glare off of the page for you. Whoops, I skipped a day. I shouldn't do that, should I? Oh, my fingers aren't working very well. Tuesday. Look at these beautiful pictures. Clap your hand. Oh my goodness, looky there. Clap your hands and celebrate all of God's creation. Oh, springtime is a beautiful time to celebrate God's creation. 
Sniff the garden's sweet rose, and your nose might meet a tiny tree frog. Clap for the river otter who flaps in water but waddles across the grass through cottonwood fuzz, finding his way from the pond to the bay. He's pretty cute, huh? Wednesday. Ooh, my, look at this. There. Give thanks for all good gifts this singing week brings. An eaglet, an eaglet learns to fly. A red fox crosses the field where rabbits stand like statues. And in the distance, a great blue heron reaches his beak first across the wideness of the sky. Okay, look right here. You can see there's the heron. You see that? Do you see the fox? I don't think the fox is on this page or the rabbits. Just the eaglet and the eagle. Oh, here we go. Here they are. <laughs> so give thanks. There's the rabbits. And there's the blue heron. And here's the fox. Looks close enough to touch, doesn't he? Thursday. Hum your praise with the buzzing bees. Walk gently under the robin's nest and follow the butterflies from bush to bush. Go down on your knees. The ladybug climbs the stem of a cornflower. See her? Can you find the ladybug? And beetles run in circles when you lift a rock. Oh, do you see the beetles down there? Friday. Sing your own special song. You were created for this. Call out cloud shapes the sky has made and watch light across the water. Come back to shore and search for pebbles and beach glass. Write your name in the sand. Saturday. Oh, we have some more birds. Birds singing. Looky here. Look at this one. You see it? There we go. there not just birds seals or sea lions lift up your prayers with all God's creation join the song of the yellow warbler the bark of the harbor seal the raucous talk of ravens and creature prayers rising from the mist up 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 Ooh, look here. Got some different things to look at. Here we have a sea star or a starfish. There's an anemone. That looks like maybe a heron or could be um, another kind of uh, bird. I'm not sure, but it looks like a heron. And then look there. Crap. Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made. Celebrate with a picnic supper by the lighthouse. There's the picnic. You can have a picnic in your backyard. A super pod of orca whales. You see the little one? has been invited and here they come breaching spy hopping clicking whistling calling spraying their praise looky there look at that did you ever think of that um xander and i read a devotional today about the songs of the whales um singing their praise to god let all creation lift its voice. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice. Rejoice.
I hope that next time you go outside, when you're out um, taking a walk or just playing in your backyard, you look for signs of God's creation. You look for um, beetles and butterflies and different kinds of flowers. And, and don't forget to thank God. And when you hear the birds singing, think, oh, they're singing praises to God. And did you know that the stars sing to God? There's a verse that says, all the starry hosts sing. And if you get on YouTube, ask your mom or dad to help you do this, or if you can do it yourself, if you're permitted to do that, and put in singing of the stars. And there will come up a couple of videos where you can listen to the sounds the stars make. It's really, really amazing. Our Creator is so, so magnificent that there are galaxies and stars that are so far away. So, 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 so far away. And yet, because of the technology and the brains that God gives to people who want to be scientists, they have discovered that they can capture these radio waves, um, light from the stars, and hear the sounds that the stars make. It's very, very fascinating. Okay, I want to read you one more story. And this is, You Are Mine, and you should recognize these two people on here. This is Eli and Punchinello from our book, You Are Special. And this is a continuation um, of that story by Max Lucado. All right, let me turn the book again so you can see the picture. There we go. Yep, maybe not quite. There. Is that better? There we go. Punchinello lived in Wemmicksville. Just like other Wemmicks, he was made of wood. Just like the other Wemmicks, he was carved by Eli, the Wemmick maker. And just like the other Wemmicks, he sometimes did silly things, like the time he began collecting boxes and balls. Things started getting crazy when a Wemmick named Tuck bought a new box. Others had boxes, but Tuck's box was a new box. Tuck loved his new box. He thought it was the best box in the village. It was orange and striped on the inside, and he was proud of it. Too proud, perhaps. He strutted up and down the street, showing off his box. Have you seen my new box? He would ask the Wemmicks he passed on the street. Would you like to touch my new box? Tuck marched right up to Punchinello. Don't you wish you had a new box, he teased. Punchinello thought Tuck's box was beautiful, and he began to wish for a box of his own. Tuck kept showing off his box, thinking he was better than the other Wemmicks just because he had a new box. Nip, another Wemmick, disagreed. My box is just as good as Tuck's, he said as he showed off his box to Wemmicks on the other side of the street. Nip's box was not new, but it was a bit bigger and a bit brighter and a bit more than Tuck could take. Tuck got very quiet and gave Nip a mad look. Then he had an idea. He stepped into a store and bought a ball. Now he had more things than Nip. He had a ball and a box. Nip frowned at Tuck's ball. Nip could do better than that. He bought two balls. With a smile on his face, two balls, and a box in his hands, he marched over to Tuck and smirked. Now I have more than you. Before he knew it, Tuck was in the store buying another box. Then Nip ran to buy another ball. Then Tuck bought a ball and Nip bought a box. Ball, box, ball, box, tuck, 
nip, nip, tuck, on and on it went. Someone could have stopped the whole mess right there. In fact, that's what the mayor tried to do. You two are being silly, he said to Nip and Tuck. Why, who cares who has the most toys? You're just jealous. Whoops, sorry about that. You're just jealous, they said to the mayor, because you don't have any. Jealous of you? Ha! Huh. But within a few moments, the mayor was in the store buying an armful of boxes and balls. Other Wemmicks began to join in. The butcher, the baker, the cabinet maker, the doctor from up the street, and the dentist from down the street. Before long, every Wemmick wanted to be the one with the most balls and boxes. Some boxes were big and some were bright. Some balls were heavy and some were light. Tall people carried them, small people carried them, everybody carried them, and everybody thought the same thought. Good Wemmicks have a lot. Not so good Wemmicks have little. When a Wemmick walked down the center of Wemmicksville with a stack of balls and boxes higher than his head, the people stopped. Now there goes a good Wemmick, they would say. But when a Wemmick passed by with only one ball or one box, the others would shake their heads and think, maybe even whisper, poor Wemmick, poor, poor Wemmick. Of course, Punchinello didn't want to be called a poor Wemmick. So he decided to get as many boxes and balls as he could. He searched through his closet and found one little ball. He dug into his pocket and found enough money for one small box. I know what I'll do, he declared. I'll sell my books to get more money to buy more boxes and balls. So he did. He bought a blue and green box with clouds painted on the sides. But still he wanted more. I'll work nights to get extra money, he told himself. So he did, and he bought a ball. And since he was working nights, he didn't need his bed, so he decided... I'll sell my bed, and he did just that to buy two more balls. Soon Punchinello had an armful, but other women had more. Some of them had so many boxes and balls they actually had trouble walking. It's hard keeping up with all my balls and boxes, they would say, acting like they were complaining, but really they were bragging. Punchinello wanted to be like these women. So he sold more stuff and got more boxes and balls. His eyes were tired from not getting any sleep and his arms were tired from carrying toys. He couldn't remember when he last sat down to rest. And worst of all, his friends couldn't remember when Punchinella last came to play. We haven't seen you for a long time, his friend Lucia said to him one day. Why don't you come and play again? asked his buddy Splint. Not everyone cared about boxes and balls. Punchinello's friends didn't, but Punchinello cared more about having boxes and balls than he cared about having friends. I've got work to do, he would tell them, and his friends would sigh. Punchinello didn't care. He only cared what the other box and ball people thought. And no matter what he did, he couldn't buy enough things to get their attention. Finally, he had an idea. I will sell my house, he decided. That's crazy, cried Lucia. Where will you live? asked Splint. Punchinello didn't know, but he didn't care. All he could think about was the boxes and balls he could have with all that money, so he sold his house. He bought boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and balls and balls and more balls. He carried so many toys he couldn't see where he was going. His stack went way above his head. But he didn't mind. So what if his arms ached? So what if he kept walking into walls? So what if he had no friends? He had boxes and balls. And when he passed Wemmicks, they would turn and say, Wow, he must be a good Wemmick. Punchinello heard them. He couldn't see them, but he heard them. And he felt good. I'm a good Wemmick. He thought to himself. 
But then somebody changed the rules. It was the mayor's wife. She was very proud of her boxes and balls. She not only had a lot of them, but she also had special kinds. She bought them at the fanciest stores with funny names and left the names on the boxes so everyone would see them. She wanted to be the best woman. One day she had an idea. Not only will I have the most, but I will go the highest. So she climbed on top of one of her boxes and shouted, Look at me, everybody! Immediately, all the box and ball people tried to outdo her. One climbed on a fountain, another on a balcony, another on a roof. It was the mayor who spotted the mountain, however. Sorry, I can't get the page apart. Here we go. Behind the village of the Wemmicks was Wemmicks Peak. I'm going to the top of the mountain, he shouted, hoping to get there first. The race was on to see which Wemmick would have the most and climb the highest. Wemmicks loaded with boxes and balls began running up the mountain. It was a crazy, crazy race. Since the wooden people couldn't see where they were going, they bumped into each other. Soon they were exhausted. They fell over their own feet. And since the trail was narrow, some fell down the side of it, but they kept going. Bringing up the rear was Punchinello. He was having a hard climb, harder than the rest. After all, he'd only been a good Wemmick for a short time. He wasn't used to carrying so many boxes and balls. He couldn't see. He didn't know he was on the side of the trail. And since he couldn't see, he didn't know that he had left the trail. All he knew was that all of a sudden, he was all alone. I must be ahead of everyone else, he thought to himself. So he kept climbing up and up and up. I must be very near the top. I'm such a good Wemmick. I'll be the highest with the most. About that time, Punchinello's foot caught the side of something. He tried to keep his balance. His toys swayed to the right, then to the left. He leaned back, then forward, but he couldn't stop. He was going to fall. He didn't know, however, that he had walked up the trail to Eli's house. He tripped on the step of the porch and tumbled through the front door of Eli's workshop. When Punchinello realized where he was, he was embarrassed. For a long time, he stayed face down on the floor, surrounded by his boxes and balls. One of the balls rolled across the floor and stopped at Eli's workbench. That's when the woodcarver turned around. Punchinello! Eli's voice was calm and deep and kind. The Wemmick still didn't move. He could feel his wooden face turning red. Looks like you've been carrying a big load. The weary Wemmick climbed to his knees, but he kept his head low. These are my boxes and balls, he said quietly. Do you play with the boxes and balls? Eli asked. Punchinello shook his head. Do you like boxes and balls? I like the way they make me feel. And, and how do they make you feel? Important, Punchinello answered, still with a small voice. Hmm, Eli observed. So you've been thinking like the other Wemmicks. You've been thinking that the more you have, the better you are and the happier you'll be. I suppose so. Come here, Punchinello. I want to show you something. Punchinello lifted his wooden head and looked at Eli. For the first time, he was relieved to see that the Wemmick maker wasn't angry. Punchinello followed Eli over to the window. Look at them, Eli said. Puncher looked out the window at the swarm of Wemmick still climbing in the mountain. They were tumbling, stumbling, fighting each other, elbowing to get ahead. Do they look happy? Eli asked. Punchinello just shook his head. Do they look important? Not at all, Punchinello said, noticing the mayor and his wife. The mayor was on the ground and she was stepping on his back. 
She had a box on her head and he had a ball in his mouth. Do you think I created Wemmix to act that way? Asked Eli. No. Punchinello felt a big hand on his shoulder. Do you know how much your boxes and balls cost you? My books and my bed and my money and my house. My little friend, they cost you much more than that. They cost you happiness. You haven't been happy, have you? No. They cost you friends and most of all, they cost you trust. You didn't trust me to make you happy. You trusted these boxes and balls. Punchinello looked at the pile of toys. All of a sudden, they didn't seem so valuable. I kind of messed up. That's okay, Eli replied. You're still special. Punchinello ducked his head and smiled. You're special not because of what you have. You're special because of who you are. You are mine. I love you. Don't forget that, little friend. I won't, Punchinello smiled. Then he paused and asked, Eli? Yes? What should I do with these boxes and balls? Perhaps you should give them to someone who really needs them. Punchinello turned to leave but stopped again. Eli? Yes? I don't have a place to sleep. Eli smiled and offered, Would you like to sleep here tonight? I sure would. I'm very tired. And so that night, Punchinello slept on a bed of wood shavings. He slept well. It felt good to be in the house of his maker. hope you enjoyed that story and I hope that you can talk about that together with your family about it's not the stuff you have it's not um, the talents you have you are special because God made you and God doesn't make mistakes remember I love you I'm praying for you and I hope you have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Hi again. I forgot to mention to you at the end of the video that um, this next week is a special week. It's the week before Easter. And it's the last week of Jesus' life on earth. So I found folder games like the games we did today that apply to different things that happened to Jesus in his last week. And I thought that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, I would do those with you. We might also read um, from scripture that goes along with the folder game, or we might read um, uh, an account of it in a Bible story book that I have. But I wanted to let you know that I will be doing that. You can watch them each day if you want. Or you could save them all and do it um, for Easter Sunday. Um, however you'd like to do it. But I wanted to let you know those will be available. Okay? Alright. Bye.